I'm going to introduce uh, Lauren Schmitz. Um, she's a good friend of mine. She was actually a graduate of the RSF Summer School uh, four years ago, and so she's um, back now to teach us about epigenetics. She got her PhD at the New School of Social Research yes. in New York and in economics. Um, she then went on to get a master's degree in genetics at Michigan, um, and now she's a professor at uh, La Follette School of Public Affairs at Wisconsin Madison. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, you guys. Well, I'm really excited to be here because, as Patrick said, I am an alumnus. Um, and uh, yeah, especially excited to be teaching epigenetics. This is something that I really dove into more in my postdoc. Um, and I'm also happy to talk in office hours today about my trajectory and my time you know, uh, that was spent going into social genomics because I think it is a, a very um, unique career choice, unique path. So happy to share what I've learned along the way there as well. Let's see. And also, I'm, I'm not a pirate, but this is just for my, for my <laughs> microphone, so. All right, so just to outline what we'll talk about today, I'm going to first spend some time reviewing epigenetic modifications. What is epigenetics? Um, then I'll talk about some of their applications uh, that might be particularly pertinent for the social sciences. Um, then I'll discuss DNA methylation measures from microarray data. How do we obtain these measures? Um, you know, what exactly are we looking at when we look at DNA methylation data? And then uh, some of the re uh, readings I assigned you look at hot topics in social epigenomics. So EWAS, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, and epigenetic clocks. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion at the end. Um, as far as the goals for the lecture, kind of how, why I designed it the way I did, was that so you could maybe walk away with a basic understanding of epigenetics and some related topics. Um, I chose these because they're of interest to social scientists and they're hot debate, they're um, really hotly debated among geneticists themselves. Um, and also so that you can kind of see the current state of knowledge. So what do we know, what don't we know? Uh, also I put here, develop a critical sociogenomic eye. What do I mean by that? So really being able to read papers in these topics from other scientific fields and then critique and integrate them. So I think a big part about, uh, of going down this path into social genomics is being uh, able to bridge methodologies and then also critique methods. Uh, and part of that then is also you know, to stimulate research ideas. So thinking about how can I as a social scientist contribute to knowledge in the field. So uh, to start, let's talk about epigenetic modifications. Uh, so first, what is epigenetics? Um, how many people in here have ever studied epigenetics or, or look at, looked at epigenetics? Know what? Anyone? Hands? I know a couple of you. A little bit. Okay. Um, so formally, it's defined as a study of mitotically or meiotically <coughs> heritable changes in gene expression that cannot be explained by changes in the DNA sequence. And there's two really key parts of that definition. The first is heritability. Uh, so DNA modifications, if they're epigenetic, they must be passed on to daughter cells. So the parent cells develop an epigenetic modification, and then that needs to be passed on to the daughter cells in order for it to be considered epigenetic. And the second major uh, issue is that it's actually inducing changes in gene expression. Uh, so modifications have a regulatory influence on gene transcription, on the creation of those mRNA transcripts. What does the epigenome do? Um, so it turns out we have a huge DNA packaging problem because we have to fit six and, a half, six and a half feet of DNA into a nucleus with a diameter of six millionths of a uh, micrometer. So uh, that, that mu m is one millionth of a meter, so six millionths of a meter. Uh, and that sounds kind of impossible. I mean, we're talking about fitting six and a half feet into something that we can't see with the naked eye. Um, it's been compared to fitting Mount Everest into a grain of rice. If you can think about that for a second. And this is something that's constantly going on in our cells every day. I think that's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, so this is where the epigenome shines. This is where it plays a huge role. Uh, so what it's doing is in order for it to fit all of that DNA inside the nucleus of a cell, it has to package it really tightly. And so it packages it into two forms of DNA, euchromatin, which is transcriptionally competent or easy to read DNA. That's kind of when you can actually see the, the DNA sequence here. And then heterochromatin or transcriptionally inert, hard to read DNA. Uh, 
So when the DNA is open like this, the transcriptional machinery, the RNA polymerase and so forth, can come down, attach itself, and create an mRNA transcript. When it's transcriptionally inert, when it's really wound tightly around these histones and then into chromatin fibers and then really you know, tightly into the nucleus, the, the transcriptional machinery can't attach itself to the DNA. So it, it's really playing a role in deciding what parts of the DNA are open and closed, which is going to vary from cell to cell because we have the same DNA in each cell, but all cells play different roles in the body. So it's, it's really also um, playing a huge role in cellular differentiation. So it's maintaining proper packaging and transcription of the genome across cell division cycles. There are three major types of epigenetic regulation. Uh, the first is DNA methylation, uh, which is what we're primarily going to be discussing today. Uh, the second is histone tail modification, so that's kind of what's controlling that chromatin accessibility. And then the last is non-coding RNAs, so these are things like small interfering RNAs um, that oftentimes will just wrap themselves around the DNA to silence the DNA. Um, so, for example, non-coding RNAs play a huge role in um, X chromosome deactivation or activation uh, together with DNA methylation. But as I mentioned today, we're going to be mostly talking about DNA methylation because we, that's kind of what we have, what we can measure right now with microassays in a way that is cheap enough that we can use it in large population studies that have the data, the social data that you all would like to use. So what is DNA methylation? Um, formally, it's when a methyl group is added to the DNA molecule at a cytosine base. Um, so here you can see this is a, a cytosine molecule, and then here uh, this is a methylated cytosine. And when this is located in a gene promoter, it usually represses gene transcription. Uh, in mammals, DNA methylation is almost exclusively found in what's called a CPG dinonucleotide, or a CPG site. Um, and a CPG is just a cytosine, a C nucleotide, followed by a G guanine nucleotide in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, so, you know, we always read DNA from the five prime to three prime direction. Um, so here you can see is a DNA strand. We have a, a C, and then we have the phosphate backbone of the DNA, so C, P, and then G. And these uh, are rare, they, they occur with less frequency than would be predicted um, because they do have a high chance of mutation. Um, they can easily kind of deanimate de and become a C can turn to a T, a methylated C. So they occur with less frequency um, and they're overly represented in gene promoter regions. Um, so they're often called CPG islands. Those are kind of clusters of CPG sites that are in the neighborhood of, of gene promoter regions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in order for something to be considered epigenetic, it needs to be maintained in the daughter cells. So here we have a, a parent strand of DNA. You can see it has the methyl marks on the CPG sites. When that DNA is replicated, we have one parent strand and one daughter strand in each new strand of DNA when the cells divide. And uh, these newly synthesized strands aren't yet methylated. So what happens is the DNA methyltransferase, DNMT1, actually comes down and lays down those methyl marks in the daughter cells. So it maintains that methylation status. And uh, this is kind of just an interesting to know for your information is that there are epigenetic writers, readers, and erasers. Um, so the writers are putting down the methyl marks, and then we have proteins that read it, and also, importantly, proteins that can erase the methyl marks, these TET proteins. And this is really important in cancer research. So there's a lot of work right now looking at how can we actually create drugs that might unmethylate or, or methylate certain areas of the genome where we want it to repress transcription, um, especially in tumor suppressor genes and so forth. So a huge, you know, I think this is what's potentially fascinating about epigenetics is that it's reversible. So we can, yes? When you say it's reading, what do you, what do you, mean, what do you mean by that? I think that this is the readers, I'm not, as, I'm not as familiar as what the readers do, but I think they're basically uh, maintaining the marks. So these are kind of writing them and then they're maintaining them and then these are erasing them, more or less. DNA methylation is really critical to development. Uh, so it's controlling which genes are active in the body, but it also plays a role in several key cellular processes, including uh, cell differentiation, so whether a cell is a muscle cell or, or a neuron or a you know, white blood cell, 
a monocyte. Um, it also plays a huge role in aging, which we'll discuss later in the lecture, and, and cancer, as I mentioned. Another thing to note is that, uh, you know, what, what actually influences DNA methylation? Well, it's uh, influenced uh, by both environmental factors, which is, of course, of huge interest to social scientists, but also genetic factors. So it's important to note that it's both environmentally and genetically influenced. Um, and a SNP that affects DNA methylation patterns is known as a methylation quantitative trait locus, or a methylation quantitative trait loci, if it's, if it's one. Um, so here you can see an example of this. So here we have a SNP. It has three different genotypes. And then depending on the genotype that the person has, we get different methylation levels. So here you can see the, the TT genotype uh, has the highest methylation levels. And these MQTLs can either be in cis, which means that they're really uh, near uh, the CPG site on the chromosome, or they can be trans, which means the SNP and the CPG site are quite far away from each other and may even be on, on different chromosomes. A big, oh yeah, sorry, yes. Uh, question, the MQPLs, are the mechanisms known? Do they directly affect one of these readers, writers, erasers, or are the mechanisms much more complex? You know, I'm not sure. I think, I think they might play a role in that. I think there might, however, be separate um, SNPs and genes that, that create those proteins. Um, I think the MQTLs are kind of more playing a role in maintaining certain methylation status, um, but uh, whether or not an MQTL is formally also doing those roles, I'm not sure. But yeah, good question. Uh, a big question that gets asked is what about ancestry? So you guys have been spending all this time talking about genetics and really thinking a lot about ancestral differences, population stratification, linkage disequilibrium, all these factors that are a big nuisance when we're working with genetic data. Um, with epigenetic data, it seems, you know, or tends, what we tend to see is that these epigenetic associations are more similar across ancestral groups than genetic associations. And it's actually, uh, you know, more uh, factors like sex and age that play a larger role in, in methylation patterns. So if you were to take the top 10 PCs of the epigenetic data, the first two would really be explaining sex and age, um, sex in particular because of that X chromosome inactivation. Uh, in females, so you see certain, way different methylation patterns in women compared to men. Um, and then age, as I mentioned, is a, is a huge factor with methylation. Um, however, as I just mentioned on the prior slide, CPG levels are influenced by SNPs, these MQTLs. And so in that case, methylation will still differ by ancestry. And so more and more epigenetic studies are controlling for PCs of genetic ancestry um, and also occasionally estimating results together and, and stratified by ancestral group. What is the utility of DNA methylation uh, for social or health scientists? What are some different um, models that we might explore or uh, some different usages? Um, so in the, in the blue box up here, I have some different um, kind of uh, basic you know, DAGs or models that you could think about. One is that it, it's a mediator of environmental exposure. So we might have some sort of environmental shock, uh, maybe your exposure to lead or something like this. Uh, that changes DNA, DNA methylation patterns and then that influences gene expression and the trait of interest. Um, but it could also be a modifier of genetic risk or even of G by E. So uh, either if we have a genotype affecting a trait, nearby DNA methylation may be modifying the strength of this association. Um, and we may also see gene environment interactions. So we might see the level of DNA methylation kind of reflecting the gene environment interaction. Um, so just based on, on these two different things, we can get mechanistic insights. From studying uh, DNA methylation, we can think about targets for intervention, and it might also help us uh, illuminate um, gene environment interactions by looking at these um, reflections in, in the DNA methylation levels. But it's this orange box down here that I think is a potential, uh, you know, much larger interest to social scientists in the sense that these DNA methylation signatures might serve as biomarkers of exposure that are not available in surveys and in, in the data that we have. Um, so for example, uh, there's pretty well established now smoking signatures. So whether you were a smoker, we can see that in your DNA methylation. And those signatures seem to be separate from epigenetic signatures of in utero smoking. So whether your mother smoked. So there might even be, you know, we might be able to distinguish between um, in utero smoking, own smoking, and these are exposures especially in the case of in utero smoking, 
that aren't always available in, in our survey data. So, uh, and those are, of course, of course, are also exposures that are of huge interest to social scientists, also things like exposure to toxicants, pollution, et cetera. Um, and also a biomarker of disease. So um, when we you know, have diseases, that can also change our methylation patterns. So um, this, all of this can kind of expand the reach of exposure measurement, and it can also reduce uh, misclassification of certain phenotypes. Um, you know, expounding a little bit on the, the biomarker point, um, more and more there's been the development of polyepigenetic scores or, or methylation risk scores. Um, it's, this, this area is really still in its infancy, um, and there are many approaches, but none are really widely accepted. So I think this is a huge area for methods development if this is something that you are interested in. Um, I've seen weighted scores using CPG level weights from EWAS. We'll talk more in a second about what an EWAS is. I've seen top hit scores, um, but these have some issues. You know, although there is some potential utility, as I mentioned, um, biomarkers for exposure, disease prediction, um, also, you know, combining just like a polygenic score or polygenic index, if we combine it of the GWAS results into a single score, that reduction of the data can help for interaction and mediation analysis. Um, but a really important issue with these scores is dealing with the correlation between CPG sites. Um, currently, there are no standard procedures available for clumping or pruning methylation data. So unlike genetic data, we don't have good ways uh, to deal with that intercorrelation. And this is a big problem um, because when you run an EWAS, you might be picking up on CPG sites that really are kind of showcasing the same signal. So they're highly interrelated. And if you combine them all into one score, you might be overestimating or, or um, you know, over predicting or, or something like that. Uh, one big solution that has emerged is to apply shrinkage methods. So uh, these are machine learning techniques like lasso regression or elastic net. And these models will pick you know, CPG sites that aren't related with one another that are most informative for the outcome of interest. Um, epigenetic clocks are one example of this application method. You could consider an epigenetic clock to be a biomarker of sorts. So we'll talk about those clocks towards the end of the lecture. Yes, Dan. Do you know what, why there aren't reference panels, or can it's not possible to just make a reference panel the way you do with genotype data? I'm not sure. I think I think um, I'm not sure. That's a really good question. I think that partially. I mean, because there are environmental influences, there might be more variation across individuals. Um, but yet, yeah, we know the location of these CPG sites. I mean, they, there are definitely, you know, there's a lot of data on the functional annotation of these different CPG sites. Um, I think they are, like, there, there have been more and more development of reference panels, but they, they haven't, I just haven't seen work that's used these to construct these biomarkers. Um, they seem to more use these, these shrinkage methods. But yeah, good question. Um, sorry, I think some of the folks on Zoom are having a bit of hard time hearing you. Can you stand okay. a bit closer to your laptop? Sure, sure. sure. Oh, oh, it's this yeah. mic. Okay, oh yeah, sorry. I'll try to. Can you guys hear me better now? Let's see. Much better. Much better. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, any other questions before I move on to the next section? Okay, um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the measures that we obtain from microarray data. Um, there are several different types of epigenetic assays uh, that quantify and, and measure DNA methylation. Um, all of these are measuring the percent of methylation in a population of cells. Regardless of how they're doing it, that's, that's what they're doing. Uh, so the most popular right now is the methylation bead chip. There was the 450K that measured around 450,000 CPG sites. This has been replaced uh, by the EPIC array, which measures around 850,000 sites. Um, and these arrays are using fluorescent probes to quantify the percent methylation after what's known as bisulfate conversion. And I'll describe briefly what that is in the next slide. But basically, it's converting those unmethylated Cs to Ts, and it, keeps, it preserves the Cs, the methylated Cs as Cs. Um, you know, this. Uh, is the other approach, which is a lot more expensive, and it's why you won't see it as much in uh, pop larger population studies, are deep sequencing approaches. So like whole genome bisulfate sequencing, these are sequencing the whole genome after bisul 
after bisulfate conversion. So they're covering a much, much you know, wider swath of CPG sites. And then it's looking at those different reads that have been sequenced after bisulfate conversion, and it's calculating the percent methylated versus unmethylated reads. Um, large epidemiological cohorts, as I mentioned, use microarray data. The pros to this, there, there are some pros. Uh, it, it makes it much more comparable across studies because they're always, always capturing the same CPG sites. Um, so you can more reliably construct these biomarkers uh, like the epigenetic clocks and make them available across studies. Whereas with whole genome bisulfate sequencing, there might be certain CPG sites that aren't well measured, uh, things like that. So it would be a little bit more troublesome. Uh, the cons is that it's really limited to the sites, of course, that are just captured on that assay, which increasingly, I think, is, is being shown to be a limiting factor. Um, there are over 21 million CPG sites on the human genome, uh, so only capturing 850,000 is not really capturing the same. And, it, and again, this is where it gets back to this. Usually with genotype arrays, they're really taking into account LD, so you're, you're, you're picking up uh, sites that are more or less intercorrelated regardless. Um, I don't think the way they selected the CPG sites on these arrays was quite as, uh, you know, based on reference panels or, um, or uh, LD. So I think they were selecting regions that they knew at the time to be really important. But of course, as science evolves, that, that changes. Um, so that's, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. But basically, the data that you'll be working with if you work with epidemiological cohorts will be the, the EPIC data. So briefly, what is bisulfate conversion? What happens is that this treatment with sodium bisulfate converts the unmethylated cytosines to uracil, while the 5-methyl uh, cytosines, so those methylated cytosines, are resistant to the conversion. Um, and then after that conversion, you have, you know, the T's are, uh, this, the unmethylated C's are turned to U's, then you get PCR amplification, cloning of, of, of the sequence, and then what happens is that these then get read as Ts in that cloning procedure. Um, and then these sequencing results are compared to the original sequences, and these methylated, unmethylated cytosines are, are distinguished based on that. Um, so that's just, you know, for your information, when, when you hear someone say bisulfate conversion, so that you understand what, what happened there. There are two main metrics uh, for measuring DNA methylation, uh, beta and M values. So the, uh, and both of these, uh, well actually I should say, so the beta value is presenting uh, the percent of methylation at a CP CPG site. Um, so it's just methylated over unmethylated plus methylated. Oftentimes there's a constant also that gets added on to the denominator. Um, the estimated uh, you know, if you multiply this by 100, it's just the estimated percent of cells methylated at a CPG site. Um, again, what's really important to note, so here's just this distribution of beta values. Um, you see it's really bimodal. So it, it, it cells either tend to be 100% methylated or not methylated at all. Um, generally, anything above 0.8 is considered methylated and anything below 0.2 is considered unmethylated. Uh, but you see you have this area here where it's, it's kind of neither. And that's really, again, a reflection of the fact that, for example, in blood, you're taking you know, all the cells that you're capturing in that sample of blood, and you're looking at the percent methylation in those cells. Um, so there might be some cells that are mosaic, um, that are partially methylated or unmethylated. So that, again, is some, a reason why uh, the data get a little bit more messy. Um, but uh, generally, you'll see that cells are methylated or not. Um, people also use M values. Um, the, the, Beta values are more biologically intuitive and meaningful. You can kind of, you know, grasp what they mean. But the M values have nicer statistical properties for testing differential methylation. So typically people take the log two of these M values and then that's approximately uh, normally distributed if you do that. So um, people use both, but by far I see uh, more use of the beta values. Methylation microarray data are messy, yes. Yeah, so do you guys remember when you learned about mRNA? Did you guys learn about RNA? And so in, in, in mRNA sequence, instead of a T, you get a U. Mm -hmm. 
So this is similar in the sense that there's, uh, it's sequencing it, so it's converting it to a U, like an mRNA transcript. And then when it gets cloned on these cells, what happens is uh, you know, they throw a bunch of nucleotides in there. And it, it's, it's really hard to do this without a picture, but I'm sure you guys looked at this. And it, it'll come in and kind of create a cDNA. So it comes in and actually reads it like DNA. And so the U is then uh, paired with a T. So yeah, it's a, it's, but yeah, good question. Any other questions before I? What cell types um, are typically captured on the? What cell types? Yeah, sorry, what cell types? Like, what? Is, it, is it coming from blood? Or yes, blood? good question. Yeah, so, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but typically um, it's either saliva or blood. Okay. Um, so in blood, what you're really capturing, because red blood cells don't have a nucleus, you're really just capturing um, white blood cells. Um, and similar with saliva, you might be getting some other epithelial cells in there and stuff. But um, this cellular subtype heterogeneity is a huge issue. So that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that. A good question. So, you know, I'm not going to talk today about QC. Uh, that's a whole other lecture. Um, and it's, it's honestly not something that I have a huge amount of expertise in. Um, but it's, it's, the QC are a lot messier. Um, un, you know, with genotype data, we have these discrete values. So a SNP either has zero, one, or two A alleles, for example, really straightforward. There's reasonable, well-established QC cutoffs. And, you know, because DNA is stable over the life course, um, it doesn't vary across tissue types. With DNA methylation microarray data, you're getting this continuous measure, you know, the percent methylation of population of cells at a given CPG site. It's going to be sensitive to underlying genetics, to the environment, and hugely to experimental conditions and batch effects. Uh, so how things were profiled in the lab can really affect uh, what's seen um, on, in, in terms of the DNA methylation levels, the output. Um, I think there's still a lot of methods development in, in uh, the QC of epigenetic data, so things are constantly evolving. I think the field has already come much, much further than when I first started looking at this. Um, but the cutoffs are a lot less straightforward. It's kind of depends on the analyst and what they think is right and things like that. Um, so there's still a lot of development in that area. Um, and then importantly, the epigenome varies across tissue types. So uh, that's a huge difference. Here, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but just for your own reference, uh, I wanted to go through some population studies that have DNA methylation data. Yes, Robo. Yeah, I was wondering whether there are similar efforts to And a what a what map? Whether there are like attempts to sort of map the AD potential AD, like. I think yeah, like uh, like D um, Dan was saying with like a reference epigenome. Um, yeah, I mean there are like so people as people are doing more whole genome bisulfate sequencing, you know because this is still pretty prohibitively expensive, so you can't do it on a ton of people. Um, but yes, more and more they are creating those types of maps. Whether or not, you know, what they're using them for and so forth, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but uh, yes, there are efforts to do that more and more, and in different ancestral groups. Um, the, yes? So when you're doing the example of cancer, you know, like how at times they say that, okay, it's cured, and then after several years, it again collapses. So, so the same epigenetic change <coughs> Yeah, so yeah, so Shuba's question was um, for the, the people on Zoom is, uh, you know, when, you know, if cancer goes away and then it comes back, is this in part because these DNA methylation patterns are returning? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't, unfortunately, know much about the epigenetics of cancer. It's a really rich field and it's just not something I've studied um, much at all. Um, that could definitely be a big part of it. So it could be that, you know, it's gotten under control and then these tumor suppressor genes are become methylated or unmethylated again and, and things start over. Um, but I can't answer that with any, yeah, degree of certainty, but yeah, good question. Um, so these are some different population studies with DNA methylation data. Um, the health and retirement study has just profiled around uh, 4,000 people um, in, in whole blood. They do have epigenetic clocks that are publicly available. The, the CPG level data should be available soon. Um, Ad Health, I believe, is also profiling a large number of people. And, and by the way, these numbers are large for epigenetic data. So you might be looking at this with uh, you know, a genetics view and thinking, those are really small. These are huge samples for epigenetics. 
Um, and they're, they're, they're huge, both because they're the cutting edge of the sample size, but also because the effect sizes are larger. Yes, that's yeah, exactly. Thank you, that, Elliot. That's exactly what I was going to say too. Is the effect sizes are much larger as well, um, and so you don't often need as big of a population or you know data as much data to identify an effect to have enough power. Um, and then uh, MESA, so these are some different ones you can take a look. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. There are more and more cohorts that are coming out with DNA methylation data. Um, importantly, a lot of these studies may require collaborative agreements to work with the data, so you might have to work with the PI or have multiple people you know, on your publication. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're wanting to work with these data for your dissertation. All right, so now let's jump into EWAS. Let me just check how we're doing on time here. I want to make sure we, does anyone have the time? 10.01. 10 10.01, thank you. And we have until, okay, yes, great, perfect. Um, okay, so let's talk about EWAS. So formally what an EWAS is, is it's just a genome-wide scan for associations between a phenotype and altered DNA methylation at thousands of CPG sites across the genome. Typically, these EWAS studies are, again, using data from these microarrays, so it's usually 450,000 sites or 850,000 sites, et cetera. Um, usually, they're regressing the beta or M value. It's usually typically the beta value on the percent methylation at a CPG probe uh, on the phenotype or exposure or trait of interest uh, with a number of different covariates. Uh, however, this can also be flipped, so uh, you, you might also see uh, the CPG site as being the predictor, um, and you're looking at some trader exposure on the left-hand side. It seems like this really depends on the research question and, and what um, your kind of hypothesis is. So if you're looking at, for example, how an environmental exposure might affect CPG methylation, you might choose to put the exposure on the right-hand side. If you're looking at how methylation affects a trader or disease, you might want to flip that. Um, this is, again, where it's a little bit tricky with epigenetics because we can't be quite as sure um, about the causality and the direction and the way things are going. Um, and, and we'll talk more in just a second about why that is such a big problem with EWAS. Um, typical covariates include sex, age, oftentimes smoking because that has a huge effect on the methylome, uh, cell type proportions. So you're going to definitely want to control for that cell type confounding because the differential methylation that you may see might be due to different proportions of cells because each cell has a each cell type has a slightly different epigenome. So you want to make sure that you're distinguishing between differences in cell type proportion and actual um, you know changes in methylation. Uh, typically, also there's a lot of technical covariates, so array position on the array, and then when possible genetic PCs. Do so we usually have data available for cell type proportion? Yeah, great question. So typically there's not flow cytometry data where they've actually done a counting of cells, um, but there are a ton of uh, different ways to estimate the proportion of cells. So the Hausman method is a big one that's used a lot, and so these algorithms will estimate kind of cellular proportions uh, just from the, the raw data. And so that's typically what people are, are using. Because yeah, flow cytometry is really expensive, so. Great question. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's customary to analyze groups separately by ancestry. Uh, a really, you know, well-established example of EWAS um, that's been really well replicated is EWAS of smoking behavior. Um, so DNA methylation really does leave a long-term signature of smoking exposure. Uh, reproducible CPG associations have been found across multiple cohorts and ancestral groups. And the genes that they then annotated to these CPGs were enriched for associations with smoking-related traits, so things like pulmonary function, cancer, uh, heart disease. Um, interestingly, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, uh, they're really, they are finding now unique epigenetic signatures for maternal cigarette use during pregnancy in cord blood of infants, and, uh, of newborns, I should say. Um, and also personal smoking in adults. There is some overlap between these sites, but they've also found really distinct signatures. So I think that's a really exciting example of where uh, this science could go, of um, the potential for creation of biomarkers of, of different exposures. Um, yes? So with the example you give, that means now we can see differentiate between in-uter exposure versus exposure during lifetime? Yes. 
Yeah, so Shuba asked, so this means that we can see in the methylome the difference between exposure to cigarette smoke during pregnancy versus personal smoking, adult smoking. Uh, and the answer is yes, they were able to identify. Um, and this, if you're interested in this, uh, check out this uh, publication down here. So Skadar et al. Okay. Um, however, you know, in some of the readings that I gave you, um, they're really showing this growing controversy uh, in the field over EWAS study design. So I think the field is really realizing increasingly, I mean, these were published back in 2018, so this crisis has been ongoing, uh, that study designs uh, were never really well equipped to address the hypotheses that they were asking. And that a lot of the results that we're getting from EWAS might be spurious um, or confounded by, by other relationships. Um, EWAS is kind of like GWAS, and this is where you know, a lot of this comes in, except you know, with GWAS, our genome stays constant over our lifetime with the example, or with the exception of somatic mutations, et cetera, like in cancer. Um, so in general, phenotype-associated events cannot change our genotype. On the other hand, uh, also genetic variants are randomly assigned with respect to the characteristics of an individual, you know, sort of mating aside. So, this uh, consistency of, of the DNA and the random assignment permit a more causal interpretation of GWAS results. Uh, so we can have a little bit more faith in, in what we're looking at. Um, with EWAS, however, we have these problems of reverse causation. So as I've been alluding to throughout the lecture, epigenomes of cells are influenced, might be influenced by rather than part of the causal process leading to a disease. So you know, the arrow can go both ways. Um, and also there can be a lot of omitted variables that might be influencing DNA methylation uh, or the phenotype. There's also the tissue issue, which we've talked about. So that's that, you know, each tissue type, blood, saliva, muscle, is going to have a different epigenome. Um, and, you know, the tissue sample that's available may not directly relate to the phenotype of interest. So if we're doing an EWAS of Alzheimer's disease, for example, ideally we would want brain tissue. Um, but that's really hard to get. So, you know, usually then you're looking at blood and there's a big question of how much can we see uh, in blood that's actually related to the epigenome of the brain. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of still an open question. Yeah. Are we methodologically able to do cell type specific by cell type sequencing? Say that again? Are we? Cell type specific by cell type sequencing. So can you get the methylation patterns for a cell type? The same way that single cell RNA So yeah, more and more there are single cell approaches to, to, um, epi to um, you know, profiling epigenetics. Um, those are still kind of expensive, but yeah, that is the future, is actually profiling the epigenome of individual cells. Yeah. It's really worth mentioning a lot of the things we'd be interested in, though, are about epigenetics in the brain, and there you basically can't get that data. Yeah, no, exactly, the, the brain tissue. But, but, you know, there are active, you know, R01s that you could look up right now that are, you know, that have been well-funded to see if we can find um, biomarkers in blood of, of ADRD. Um, so that is an active research area, obviously also because it's less invasive. You know, if we could just look at people's blood and, and you know, be able to see if they're developing Alzheimer's disease or dementia-related, uh, you know, aspect, uh, you know, phenotypes, um, that would be, of course, huge interest. So I don't want to say it's a total no either, because I think uh, there could be something that we're seeing there, um, but it's an active area of study. And, and I think the ones that I know, um, I know a, a, a researcher at Wisconsin, his name's Reed Alsh, who's doing that. Um, he, he wasn't able to find anything on the array. So he's, using, he's doing whole genome bisulfate sequencing uh, to, to calculate these, these blood biomarkers. So using a much richer um, sample of CPG sites. Yeah, so, you know, just in my admittedly limited experience doing some of this, just a few cases, you know, I often find that I, when I talk to biologists, they're really concerned about this issue of what the tissue type is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, biologists aren't statisticians. And, like, even if you have a tissue type that has an, a much different kind of average um, uh, uh, level of, you know, uh, 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 of methylation in particular sites, it's not clear to me that that necessarily means that the ordering of individuals around that mean 
is is completely washed out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I have we, we've created scores. So mm -hmm. this doesn't speak to the brain directly, but we've created scores from EWAS that were conducted in uh, on the basis of blood, mm -hmm. and and use them to predict phenotypes. Uh, actually, in children, so adults, mm -hmm. blood, children, um, saliva, mm -hmm. and we can, you know, reproduce the original kind of finding with respect to predicting the same phenotype. Mm -hmm. So, like, and we've also found that transfers across um, ancestry. Well, yeah. So, so I think a lot of these presentations are more theoretical than empirical. I mean, we're gonna yeah. have to see how. Like, that's that's just yeah. in my own personal experience. Yeah. We'll have to see, but I, like. You know, we're very sensitized, for instance, about ancestry and portability for good reason, but it comes from our experience with GWA. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that in, in EWA, mm -hmm. but we're still sensitized to it. And I think that we're sensitized because of biological theory about portability across tissue types. But I, I think empirically, we're beginning to see that perhaps there is some portability. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of, of putting putting it. As, and as you can see, I'm kind of saying that, that empirical side and then I'm expressing these caveats because we know that these also exist but I think that's a good way of distinguishing it is that empirically we're not seeing huge differences by ancestry. Um, we're not seeing, uh, we are seeing that DNA, you know, methylation in blood can predict a, a wide range of, of disease. Um, but it's like, yeah, again, coming back to this thing that we know these are different cells. So what exactly is it picking up on biologically? Um, you know, white blood cells, you know, definitely do play a huge role in, in a lot of formation of disease. So um, it could have something along those lines. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and as a more empirist person, that's also what I see. And then, you know, so yeah, thanks. Um, all right. Um, as we mentioned, the cell type cell cellular heterogeneity. Um, so, and also I should mention that, you know, a lot of, you know, this isn't always a nuisance, the cell type heterogeneity. I think that's also important to mention. So um, changing proportions of cell types, especially white blood cell types, could be of huge interest, you know, because we know that those proportions, proportions might change as, uh, you know, we're undergoing um, stress in the body and things like that. And so that might actually be something we want to capture. Um, and indeed with the epigenetic clocks, there's intrinsic and extrinsic measures that take into account, you know, uh, the cell types heterogeneity as part of the signature. So it, it can also be something that you want to exploit, but um, it can also be a huge confounder if, if you're not careful. Um, the other thing is that you know most changes in DNA methylation are pretty modest during the life course. Um, in utero, so about 80% of our epigenome is laid down in utero. As you can imagine, you know that makes sense because you know we started from these primordial germ cells and then we evolved. Um, and uh, those cells started to differentiate into different types of cells, and that was all the epigenome that was playing that role in that, in that cellular differentiation. Um, so you get this kind of bimodal distribution generally where cells are either complete me completely methylated or not. Um, but there are methylation changes that can occur throughout the life course, but you know, a big thing is if you're capturing you know, these kind of, in EWAS you might be capturing some of these really small changes and that might be more to this kind of cell type heterogeneity or more mosaicism of cells uh, rather than actual differences in DNA methylation. So that's something that also has to kind of go into the consideration of EWAS results. Um, as I mentioned, there's also issues with genetic influences. So, you know, that these SNPs can, can impact uh, variability in DNA, DNA methylation. And then um, also transcription. So it, it could be that differences in gene transcription generate DNA methylation changes. And, and so, again, you get this kind of, I just kind of created this DAG, which is just like a box of, you know, arrows going all these different directions. So, but it's, I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's what we're working with. So you also really messy, why bother? Um, epigenetics can generate new insights, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about into disease mechanisms precisely because of its immutability. Um, or mutability, I should say. So when you're looking at DNA methylation, I think what's really interesting about it is it's this time and, content, time and context dependent program. So you're not studying gene expression, but rather the potential for gene expression. Um, and that might kind of help us tease apart what's biological, what's environmental. Um, and, and for the other you know, issues, we could potentially detect and reverse onsets of disease. 
So this is an important field, you know, to, to continue to chip away out, to chip away on, but um, to tease apart the causality, we really need much better study designs. And I think longitudinal data, too, is going to be hugely helpful um, in, in moving this field forward as well. All right, so now one of my favorite topics, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, so this idea that we can inherit trauma has just captured the imagination of social scientists. Um, I'm just going to read a quote from the New York Times article that I assigned because I think it's a really great capture of, of, of you know, why this has really captured the imagination. The idea that we carry some biological trace of our ancestors' pain has a strong emotional appeal. It resonates with the feelings that arise when one views images of famine, war, or slavery, and it seems to buttress psychodynamic narratives about trauma and how its legacy can reverberate through families and down the ages. But for now, and for many scientists, the research in epigenetics falls well short of demonstrating that past human cruelties affect our physiology today in any predictable or consistent way. Um, so that was written again back in 2018, um, and, and I would say that that continues to hold today in terms of the evidence. Um, so let's, let's talk through this a little bit more. What actually is uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance and, and what evidence do we have? Um, so in each new generation, DNA methylation patterns are erased and reset twice. Um, so this first global DNA demethylation occurs in the parental gametes, so in the sperm and the egg. Um, there's kind of a global demethylation that occurs. And then the second occurs after fertilization in the developing embryo. Um, one kind of, you know, caveat to this is genomic imprinting. That is one except uh, that kind of those epigenetics are not erased and are kind of play an important role in deciding which allele is expressed. We won't go into that, but those serve a very specific biological function. Um, with TEI, what we see, uh, what you know, theoretically would happen is incomplete erasing of epigenetic signatures um, due to some sort of environmental exposure. Um, and this would then permit transfer of the epigenetic marks from parents to offspring. Um, importantly, this is often confused with epigenetic changes from intrauterine exposures. Uh, the epigenome is particularly vulnerable to environmental factors during embryogenesis. And so, yes, you know, the epigenome can be influenced while you are in utero, but that is very different than marks being passed down through the generations. Um, and so oftentimes when people say, or when they're talking about TEI, what they're really talking about is intrauterine exposure um, and this uh, similarity between the epigenome of the parents and the offspring that is a result of that. So, you know, just what conditions actually would need to hold for us to be able to see transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in humans? So uh, in the female germline, if a female is pregnant, the epigenetic marks and the phenotype resulting from the environmental exposure, so let's say uh, the woman is, is pregnant and she's exposed to famine, um, that would have to be maintained for at least four generations for us to be able to say it's transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Why? Well, you can see here in this case when she's pregnant, she's carrying the, the fetus that has an epigenome that could be influenced directly by the famine. and then. The, the fetus also has its own germ cells. Um, so those germ cells can also be influenced by the current environment of the mother. And so you would need to see these marks persist into F3 in order to claim that there was actual passage of epigenetic marks across the generations due to this environmental exposure. Um, in the male line, you would just need uh, three generations. And if the woman's not pregnant, then three generations. So as you can imagine, this makes it very difficult to study in humans. Um, to date, there is no evidence of TEI in humans. Um, unlike anim uh, animal models, of course, the causality is really difficult uh, to establish of the environmental exposure, and it's really hard to see this transmission. And you would need longitudinal multi-generational epigen epigenomic data to show this uh, maintenance across three to four generations, and that just doesn't exist. Um, so that's you know, in the future, maybe one day. Um, and then uh, it's also difficult to distinguish between, even if we did have the longitudinal data and the three to four generations of data, it would be really difficult to distinguish between inherited genetic factors that influence the epigenome and TEI. So that's the other issue is this inheritance 
um, being of, of methylation through the genome. Uh, in terms of the current evidence from studies in humans, there is some evidence that nutrition, smoking, irradiation, and trauma may affect the grandchildren's phenotype or the risk of disease. Um, the evidence, there's, for example, evidence showing similarities in epigenetic profiles between parent and offspring that were um, exposed to the Dutch hunger winter or the Quebec ice storm. Um, but again, these could result from intrauterine exposure, germline transmission of phenotype via genetics or genetic mutations, mutations in DNA repair mechanisms, and genetic mutations in, in epigenetic modifiers, rather than, again, this continuity of the marks across generations. And it could also just be completely social. And that too, yeah, we pass on our behaviors. Um, yeah, if, if a mom was really exposed to, to trauma and that then changed how she, uh, you know, parented or whatever, and then the child takes on those things and those stress, exactly, yeah. So biological and social, it's very complex. So, um, yeah, so this is one example of really having a critical eye when, when you see um, some of these claims um, in, in research. Any questions about this before I move on? Yes. Um, has this been established and proved in like other animal models or model mechanisms? Yeah, so in, biologically? in animal models, they, they do see some evidence of this. Um, but I think it's, they have some similar issues. And, and also, it would be very, it's kind of difficult to extrapolate from mice to humans because they have slightly just different epigenetic um, uh, kind of mechanisms, or, or there's some things that make it a little bit difficult um, in that. Uh, Karen Michael's article that I assigned, they also kind of discuss a little bit the, the evidence in, in animals. But, um, you know, this is something that they're continuing to, to gather. Um, there are current ongoing studies where they're looking at this in mice um, in terms of toxicant exposures. Um, so there's a big um, uh, NIH study that's looking at different toxicant exposures across different universities in mice. Um, and there they are seeing some evidence, but it's not overwhelming either. So it's, it's also kind of a little bit of a question mark. Um, all right. And then the last one is epigenetic clocks. So how are we doing on time? Do we still have? Okay, 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, so epigenetic clocks are these DNA methylation biomarkers of aging. Um, Obviously, chronological age is the strongest risk factor for most chronic diseases, right? As we get older, we, we get more disease, the body starts to break down. Um, but we also know that chronological age is a really imperfect measure of aging. Um, the aging process isn't linear. We're forcing it to be linear when we look at chronological age. Um, and that differs a lot from biological age from these different rates of aging that we do observe across individuals. Uh, and so we really need some reliable biomarkers of aging to capture the biological aging process. And this has long been the goal of geroscience. So this has been ongoing for, for decades um, in geroscience. Um, and really, why? What's the point? Well, if we could elucidate factors that influence aging, that could lead to discoveries that can halt, slow, or even reverse the aging process. So huge interest in this, um, of course, at the NIH and, and NIA and other um, scientific uh, funders, et cetera. Um, so these epigenetic clocks have emerged as biomarkers of aging um, over the past decade or so. Um, it turns out that DNA methylation really exhibits extremely precise transformations with age. So over time, there, there are these kind of global shifts in methylation that occur as we age. Um, and so epigenetic clocks are composite scores of CPG sites that are highly selected uh, to predict chronological age um, or increasingly uh, phenotypes of aging. Um, so it's kind of almost like a polygenic index for, uh, you know, age or something like that, but with methylation. Um, and it turns out that these clocks are remarkably accurate at predicting chronological age, especially if they're trained on chronological age. And then deviations between them uh, are associated with age-related diseases and mortality. Um, so they do appear to be stronger um, you know, predictors of mortality than other aging biomarkers or, you know, indexes of frailty um, and other things that, that uh, have been, you know, popular in the gerontology field. So how are these estimated? Um, so they're built by regressing chronological age or phenotypic age on a set of CPG sites using these supervised machine learning methods. 
Um, so penalized regression like loss or elastic net, this is shrinking or constraining the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients uh, to some predefined value between 0 and 1. Um, and the result is that it's selecting the most informative CPGs for age prediction. Um, so in the example of the Horvath clock, which was one of the first clocks, um, there's you know, 353 CPG sites that go into the construction of that DNA methylation age uh, biomarker. Increasingly, so um, as time went on, uh, you know, scientists realized it might be better to actually train this uh, on not chronological age, but biological age. Um, so, and by biological age, you know, other phenotypes of aging, like uh, blood-based biomarkers or, um, you know, frailty, things like that. So, and this is kind of, this figure is kind of showcasing this. So, here are two people who were both uh, born at the same time, uh, but the blue person, uh, you know, ages at a slower rate and lives to age 100, and the red person ages uh, much faster and dies at age 80. If we were to look at um, kind of uh, chronological age versus methylation age using a clock that was trained on uh, chronological age, you can see that it's kind of just reflecting uh, these differences along this 45 degree line. Whereas if it's trained on biological age, we can kind of uh, start to see deviations from that line. So we can see um, some differences that might have biologically contributed to the rate of aging. Um, However, these biological clocks aren't going to be as great of predictors of chronological age. So there's, there's some trade-offs there. Um, this slide is just to show that, you know, to date, I think uh, there's at least 13, probably more than that by now, probably over 13, I should just say, clocks have been developed. Um, there are approximately 1,600 CPGs that have been identified across all these clocks, but very few of them overlap. So that's been this new puzzle in the field, um, you know, why are these CPG sites, why is it not choosing the same CPG sites across these different clocks, what's going on? Um, you know, and I think it really comes down to the fact that these were constructed using different training phenotypes, different training samples, um, and across different tissue types as well. So some of these clocks, uh, like the Horvath clock, were derived um, in 51 different tissues and cells, so he kind of designed it to be a pan-tissue clock. Um, versus some of the others that were uh, done in whole blood. Um, it could be that they're picking up on slightly different aging pathways or hallmarks, or this could get back to the fact of, you know, as I've been explaining, that there's this intercorrelation between these CPG sites. And so these, you know, machine learning techniques might just be picking CPG sites that are really highly related to one another, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason in that training sample, that CPG, you know, whatever, it could kind of just be, um, that, that could be what we were seeing. And indeed, in a, a more recent study by Morgan Levine and colleagues, they did show that um, kind of the, the overall biological pathways seem to be remarkably similar across the clocks, even though they were selecting different CPG sites. Um, oftentimes, we refer to these as first-generation clocks, the ones that were trained on chronological age, and then these are these uh, second-generation clocks. But they may also be capturing slightly different things, so I don't want you to think that they're all capturing the same thing. And, and one way of looking at that, so I just had a recent study that was released where we looked at, you know, just associations between socioeconomic status and eight different clocks in two large studies, large for epigenetics, in the HRS and in MESA. And really, we only found associations with SES in these second generation clocks. Um, so these first generation clocks, we just didn't see anything uh, so it could be that these are picking up more on these inter-individual variations um, in uh, biological age that are, you know, more proximal or closer to the social environment. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind as well, is that if you're going to, you know, look at the clocks, you might want to look at more than one. Don't just look at one. Uh, they're not all the same. All right, so that gives us some time for discussion. Um, I have some open questions in the field here, and then I also, um, which most of these I think we've um, brought up, um, you know, are these causal, these signatures? One that I have a big question about is can we actually, okay, we see these differences in signatures between cord blood in children, you know, who are supposed to interuterine smoking, and we see um, in, in adults, but, you know, what is the half-life of these exposures? So will we still be able to see these inter interuterine exposures in uh, people when they're 85, for example, or do those eventually fade and go away? Um, that's, of course, important for biomarker construction. 
Um, and then we brought up the, the blood, reli how reliable are these blood-based biomarkers? Um, and then I'll just throw these up as some questions. But yeah, now I want to hear from you all. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the epigenetic box. So what does the epigenetic part in the name allude to? Like, does it mean that like potentially if someone has a uh, uh, much more accelerated epigenetic clock, does that mean that that gets passed on to the offspring? Um, no, so it's, it's referring to the methylation, so epigenetic meaning DNA methylation, um, and these theoretically shouldn't be passed on to the offspring because of that global erasure of, of methylation in, um, in the, in the uh, gametes, as I mentioned. Um, but within the person, they might be heritable uh, because they're passed on to daughter cells. So that's, yeah, when I was, that's a, that's a good question just to eliminate any confusion there. When I say heritability, uh, from parent to daughter cells, that's different than heritability in terms of, yeah, you know, kind of genetic variation and, and how that influences the phenotype and how that's passed along to generations. Yeah. Question? Um, if you go back to the slide, now, like, I see its association. Uh, if you didn't take an association with the Yes, let's see. Did not like that. thinking Um, but we did also we did also look at childhood SES. We didn't find any strong. Um, we, we only had parental education, which has its own issues. But um, so, but we didn't yeah. see any big um, kind of mediation by uh, parental or SES or anything like that when we looked at that. But yeah, this SES index is co combination of income, wealth, occupation, um, education, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. I was, yeah, I was just wondering, is it possible to capture some, like, let's just respect the occupational history of the world, like, exposure to the, like, previous, like, occupational information? Yeah, yeah, so I think here what we did use was actually the longest held occupation. Um, so we, we didn't, because some of these people had already retired, yeah. so we used the longest held occupation um, right. in the HRS, um, and in MESA, MESA had a similar measure. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Great, thank you. Um, I am very fascinated by the epigenetic uh, biological talk, specifically about the predictability of mm -hmm. epigenetic talk across the life course. Mm -hmm. So I see that, like, with older adults, um, there is, like, age related or age related or senescence related. So in terms of, um, yeah, it's a good question. So in terms of the chronological age um, predictors, um, they in part were designed to be predictive across the life course. So because they were using tissue types from, uh, you know, infants, uh, you know, they had cord blood in there, you know, Horvath kind of threw everything in there. Mm -hmm. So those actually are pretty accurate predictors across the life course. So they can predict uh, childhood, you know, the age of children as well as of adults. Um, as far as these kind of these clocks that are measuring more the rate of aging or um, inter-individual variation in aging, uh, that I'm not as sure um, whether, you know, how they perform across the life course. Um, that's a good question. I'm sure there's a paper on it. Um, I, I do know that, 
um, you know, sometimes like looking at childhood exposures and their influence on these clocks, I haven't found a whole, whole lot. Um, but again, that could be due to a lot of different factors, just noisiness of the measures and things like that, um, self-reports. Um, but I think um, the theory is that these exposures might be changing this hyper-hypomethylation and, and that's kind of, uh, you know, might be partially influencing. There are these kind of intrinsic things that happen as we age in the epigenome, but then those things might also be influenced by exposures and that's why some people might, you know, age faster or slower. So, um, yeah, as far as whether or not they're, you know, as predictive in children, these rate of aging measures, I'm not sure. I think, well, you guys had a paper. You, yeah, saw, so you saw it in children, yeah. So in the Texas Twin Project, we've got, um, currently it's about 1,200 people with the uh, epic array, so that's the 800,000 markers. Oh, nice, nice. And, I should put um, on the slide. We, um, our first paper was based on the first, the first 600 or so of them, and that was in pediatrics. And we, um, so for the, the, the clocks that basically track age, and that have been developed mostly in adults, they still, and in blood typically, they still track age mm -hmm. in children and saliva. Mm -hmm. um, but they tend not to be socially stratified. Mm -hmm. However, the ones that track rate of aging, so specifically the Dunedin mm -hmm. base of aging clock, that one yeah, is, one. first of all, it doesn't correlate with age because it's, it's a, it's it's a, a rate of aging. Right? right, so so it's not supposed to change with age unless there's curvilinearity, linearity, mm -hmm. but it is socially stratified. Um, and it's not easily explained by like ancestral PCs or anything like that. So it's mm -hmm. not just like a like a um, you know a, 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 a kind of stratification artifact as far as we can tell. But it is it, it, but it is collinear with with you know parental education, mm -hmm. family income, uh, being a racial or ethnic minority. Yeah, so and then, and so it's interesting. So you were finding that in this kind of sample of adolescents. It's uh, 8 to 18 year olds. Okay, 8 to 18 year olds. And then, whereas I wasn't seeing those signatures as much into adulthood with these clocks, it's, in terms of childhood SES, I wasn't seeing a strong relationship there. Oh, so like that's people the when they were. Association that you have plotted there, that's with adult SES. This is adult, all adult SES. So we, basically, then the, as far as if we were to put those together, that would be a, that there's a concurrent relation between. SES and um, Dunedin, at least. Yeah, but not, but not necessarily this long, yeah, term, That's whether, yeah. So, yeah, because I think that kind of gets a little about your question. So, and again, all we had was parental education. So, um, I am, however, I'm about to get out a study that's looking in MESA at um, exposures um, to adverse childhood experiences, so things like trauma and neglect. Um, just associations, and we don't see anything there either in terms of older individuals, the associations with those, with any of these clocks. Um, so. Oh, and I should also say that when we increase the sound test to the close to 1200, 1180, the results are unchanged. So, oh, that's, um, okay, that's it. It doesn't, you know, I mean. That's nice. Yeah, you know, it, we'd still like to see it replicated in other samples. So. I think they did look at an e risk, which is like 18 year old. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, British 18 year olds, I think they also found social stratification of the Dunedin clock. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, that clock is pretty good. We yeah. also, so Ricardo Marioni, who does some of this mm -hmm. stuff as well, he just developed a, uh, a, not a clock, but just an epigenetic predictor of late life cognition. Mm -hmm. And that's also socially stratified in the Texas Twins sample mm -hmm. and associated with cognitive measures. In the oh, interesting. Texas sample. So we're Interesting. Uh, so a lot of these clocks <coughs> seem both phenotypically relevant and socially stratified. And socially stratified, yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, that's what everyone was hoping to see with telomere length and with cortisol and that yep. stuff didn't really replicate. So. Yep. I think these have, have definitely emerged as being, yeah, kind of more, um, yeah, stronger kind of biomarkers of aging than some of these others had been hypothesized. but. Yeah, what are the underlying mechanisms, all this sort of stuff, that still really needs to be teased out. So big, yeah, open area for you guys to, to step in. Yeah, Robo. So I was wondering, like, uh, beyond uh, uh, using the epigenetic clocks uh, to predict, like, a given phenotype, maybe using them as controls instead of just, like, the chronological mm -hmm. age, 
maybe has there been any study that actually replaces the coronary coverage with uh, the epigenetic clocks and sort of see potential uh, reduction of attenuation bias or confounds that may influence like the coronary age? Yeah. Especially like phenotypes that are impacted by by, like, by biological aging yeah. and these sorts of things. Um, I don't know. Off, offhand, I don't know if there's been a study that specifically looked at that, like whether kind of adding it as a control in addition to chronological age kind of improves the fit of the model or um, I'm sure there have been, you know, there's, I mean, it, the explosion of this research has been, it's just, it's hard to keep up with. But I think, um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, if it's really highly correlated with chronological age, I think it would depend on what clock it was. So you wouldn't want to maybe throw Horvath in there because it's so highly correlated with chronological age. Some of these that are picking up deviations from chronological age could be potentially useful, um, but they might also capture some of the variation that you kind of want to, it, so it would kind of depend on the model, I think, and what you wanted to look at, but yeah, um, it's a good question. I think Dan, yeah. I, I think, I love Robo's idea of using it as a control. Just the one thing to be careful about is that you, you would need to have measured the epigenetics prior to whatever you're looking at the effect of because mm -hmm. the epigenome changes over time. Mm -hmm. So it's unlike the, you know, using a, a polygenic index to control in that way. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, well, thank you guys. I'll be at office hours. So one more. Yeah. So one final question is like, uh, so what one caveat you mentioned is like reverse causality might be an issue. But wouldn't using like uh, an MQ2 that's influencing the DNA signature, wouldn't that help like differentiate between like direction and thing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, people have been using um, like George Davy Smith have, and uh, has developed like a two-step MQTL um, Mendelian randomization technique where you're using the MQTLs to to um, you know, instrument the methylation and, and those kinds of things, I think, are helpful if you can show that the MQTL isn't also influencing the phenotype that it's only working through, you know, the methylation. Um, yeah, so good point. So there's a lot of um, that. That is also kind of really widely developing as an area of research. So um, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys.